Good morning, gentlemen. It's a wonderful day. And I'm going to talk of something very significant, something which happened 60 years back. That's a long time. But in history, it's a very small time. I'm going to talk of the Chinese invasion of India, which took place on 20th October 1962. That was the time when the Chinese army moved in en masse, I wouldn't say en masse, but in sufficient numbers, 80,000 soldiers mounted an offensive all along the Himalayan border with India and facing them were just about 20,000 Indian troops. And what happened was very clear. The Chinese overran the Indians and particularly in the old Northeast Frontier Agency, it was a catastrophic defeat. The Indian Army put up a good fight in Ladakh and radio peaking in its broadcast in 1962 admitted that they had suffered some losses in the Ladakh sector. Now what was happened that a nation which had a history of a wonderful army for the last 250 years under the British, which was known as the British Indian Army, which went in 1842 to China and again in 1856 in the first and second opium wars and beat the hell out of the Chinese. The same army in 1900 during the Boxer Rebellion moved into Beijing which was basically the Punjab regiment which went and there also the same thing happened. So an army which had bested the Chinese three times suddenly found itself at its wit's end. What happened? I mean it's worth looking at that aspect now. And it's important, I'll tell you why. Because India is again faced with a similar situation for the last two to three years with China on the border on what is known as the LAC, the line of actual control. Because Chinese do not recognize the LOC, the line of control. They don't believe in it. They say the border is undemarcated and they are correct. No doubt about it. This border is a legacy of the British Raj. That also is a fact. So where do we go from here? What happens next? We don't know. But we do know that we are faced with a very, very formidable adversary. And let's have a look at the situation at that time in 1959 to 1962. First of all, at that time, General Thamaya was made the army chief. And sadly, two Sikh generals, I think if I remember correctly, Lieutenant General Sun Singh and Lieutenant General Kulwan Singh were superseded. At that time, Pandit Nehru said that we do not follow the principle of seniority in promotion to the army chief, we go by merit. But insiders tell me that Nehru had an apathy to North Indians, in particular the Sikhs, who he felt had been the main props of the British Raj. Hence the two generals were left out. And also Nehru had a fear of a military coup because at that time General Niwin was in power in Burma and very shortly General Ayub Khan had taken over control in Pakistan and declared himself as the Chief Martial Law Administrator. So General Tamaya was made the Chief. It's to the credit of General Tamaya, he was a realistic man and he decided that India could not fight China. Now this was based on the inputs which were given to him. And in a paper, I think, he put up to the government, he was very clear that India cannot fight China. He advocated a border solution with China. And when the Chinese Prime Minister Chao Wanlai came to India with a package plan for a border settlement, he was all in favor of it. And what was that plan? The plan was very simple. The Chinese were going to recognize the McMohan line in the Eastern Front as the de facto and the de jure border, while they expected India to relinquish its claim on Aksai Chin. 
because the British had made an artificial line there, which is called the Johnson Line, named after the explorer Johnson who had gone into that area, and they had claimed that area from Tibet. This proposal was not accepted by the Indians. I am not going to the details of what happened, because there are a lot of politics involved in this, but the crux was the Indians didn't accept the proposal, in particular Nehru didn't accept it, because Nehru thought he was a great third world leader, and Chow and Lai were not up to his standard. In fact, uh, it's, a fa uh, it's true, very true, that Nehru had introduced Chow and Lai at the 1955 Bandung Conference, when China was an ostracized nation. But the Chinese forgot all about that, because in the game of power politics, it doesn't really matter who introduces or doesn't introduce. What matters are brass tacks. Then, Peculiar things began to happen in the Indian general staff. Krishna Manan was made the defense minister. Now, Krishna Manan was out and out an Englishman with an English thinking, though he had a black brown skin. He was what you call the epitome of the brown Englishman. And the Indian general staff at that time, almost all the generals were all Sanders trained. And they also were greatly energized. They were influenced by English thought. And none of them really had thought about the northern border. And Timaya was the first man to think about it. But Nehru disregarded Timaya. And Timaya then took up a very obscure reason to vent his feelings. There was, I think, a cousin of Jawaharlal Nehru, maybe his nephew or something, called BM Call. He was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General when he had no experience of commanding a div or any operational unit. And General Thimaya objected to it and he resigned on that grounds. He was un unhappy on a lot of other things, the way Krishna Menon was handling the army. Krishna Menon was an intellectual, a wonderful man. I have a lot of regard for him. But his knowledge of Military warfare was a big zero. He didn't know anything about it. He was just interested in ego clashes with the generals. And he kept on playing one general against the other. Now this gentleman, uh, Timaya, didn't stick to his guns. That's the sad part of it. Once you resigned, you resign, you go home. But Nehru called him and he withdrew his resignation. Now that's another mystery. And after that, he was a lame duck chief. But though he did... Uh, tried to make some scrabbles here and there, you know, make some noise, but that had no meaning. And the last noise he made was when he wanted Lieutenant General Thorat, who was not the senior most general to be made the army chief. And he wrote a letter to the president at that time, Dr. Rajendra Prashad, recommending that Thorat be made the army chief on the grounds that as per the constitution, the commander in chief of the Indian Armed Forces is the president. And the president is competent to appoint a CNC. Rajendra Prashad took this very seriously. He consulted a few of his experts, the constitutional experts, as they said, you can appoint. And he wrote a letter to the Ministry of Defense that General Thorat be appointed the army chief. Now, there was a lot of hell to play because Nehru and Menon were really flummoxed. They didn't know what to do. They wanted General Thapar to be made the army chief. And of course, Nehru went to Rajendra Prashad and explained everything to him. But Prashad stuck to his guns. Ultimately, some vague threats were made to him and, finally, and Dr. Rajendra Prashad relented. Now comes to the very peculiar thing. At that time, General Thapar, who was the second senior man, in the hierarchy, he wrote a letter to General Thamaya in which he made wild allegations against the army chief. Now, you just imagine, he was the vice chief, Thamaya was the chief, and here's the vice chief writing a letter to the army chief that these are the omiss omissions and uh, mistakes and crimes you have committed. And he ended up with a line that this is with the knowledge of the Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, and you may like to explain your point of view to the Prime Minister. Now, this was something absolutely silly. 
<clears throat> but all the same, the cat was out of the bag. It showed that the generals were knives drawn against each other. And such a, in such a situation, you could, cannot expect the Indian army to go and face the Chinese. Thorat, of course, was sidelined. He didn't become the chief. Tapa was made the chief. And Thimaya went into oblivion. Another point which was made at that time was that uh, there was another important man, left in general at that time, that was Sam Manaksha. He was the commandant of the Defense Academy, the Defense Staff College in Wellington. And there was an allegation against him that in his office, he had photographs and paintings of Robert Clive and the Duke of Wellesley and Warren Hastings adorning the place where he used to sit. Now, this has uh, not been substantiated, I'll say that much. But the allegations were there. And the committee was appointed to go and look into it. And probably when they went there, and they didn't see the photograph, they so, so they exonerated Manaksha. But then there is a good chance that even if the paintings were there and Manaksha knew that this committee is coming, he would have removed the paintings. But Manaksha himself had no battle experience ever. That, let's understand this point. Even in the 62 conflict, he was nowhere. He was, I think, since the Eastern Command, he just kept on sitting there. Nothing to do. In the Pakistan War in 1965, he again had nothing to do. So, he had no battle experience, yet he became the army chief. And then there are this allegation that he was an anglicized man. Thapar became the army chief, but he was out of his depth again. He wanted to be chief, he became chief. Menon wanted him and so he was made chief. Krishna Menon, as I've already said, was a very brilliant man. But brilliance doesn't mean that you're a good defense minister. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And you are formidable, facing a very formidable, politically oriented force across the border. The People's Liberation Army. And Mao Zedong was a different man. I mean, he's not like uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, you know living in a dream world. He was a very practical man and he's, he had a one-point plan to make China the superpower in the world. And it's big, as for him, his foundation that has now led to China being a terror in which the Americans are also very, very, very of this dragon. They have the second biggest economy in the world, $16 trillion. And India is nowhere nearby three. And one may well ask a question that when India and China were together in 1948, India was much ahead of China. And what happened after that? So, a picture, we can have a look. Because how you look, only the mirror will tell you. And the mirror tells you that the Indian leadership was devoid of any strategic sense. That is the crucial point. No strategic sense, no cohesion. And of course, Nehru was the biggest culprit of all because he was scared of a military coup. General Yu Khan was there in Pakistan, General Nevin in Burma, and even in Thailand there was a military coup, I think. And so all around there were military coups, and he was feeling mighty insecure, so he kept the army generals fighting against each other. After General Tamaya left, Thapar came in. But he should have beefed up the border because at that time, India had come to know that of the incursion of the Chinese. And because of India's own foolishness, the entire Aksan Chin area, almost 30,000 square miles, was handed over to China on a platter. The Indians didn't even know about it. Now, you can well imagine, you are claiming a territory on the map, but you, on the ground, you are nowhere. You don't even know where the Chinese are making a road there. They made a big road from Tibet to Xinjiang. And the Indians didn't know about it. Nehru then once made a statement in Parliament, once he came to know about it, he said, we are going to allow the Chinese to use it for civilian purposes. And you think China is going to listen to them? To Mr. Nehru? No. And the stage was set for a fight. And when the stage is set for a fight, you build up your muscle, which the Indians didn't do. The Indians were going and setting up some isolated posts 
in no man's land and trying to claim the area under instructions from Nehru, what he called the forward policy. And there's a wonderful book, India's China War by Maxwell, in which he has clearly brought out that the war was instigated by the actions of the Indians. It may be true, may not be true, but the fact is India didn't want a conflict with China. They all wanted to make was to score some points. And in a game of chess, scoring points has no meaning because the aim is to checkmate the queen and the king, the king, and the game is over. And this is what the Chinese were planning. Once Chow and Lai failed to ask the Indians to agree for a negotiated settlement because the McMahon line was not a big deal. There's a McMahon line in Burma also and which was accepted by the Chinese. It's logical that they would have accepted the McMahon line in Nepa, Northeast Frontier Agency, which is now called Arunachal Pradesh. But obviously they wouldn't have relinquished hold over Aksai Chin, which in any case was a no man's land. And Pandit Nehru has gone on record to say that not a blade of grass grows there. But that doesn't mean you're going to hand it over to the Chinese. But that's precisely what happened. With this build-up going on, Nehru once, he was going to Sri Lanka on a visit, was asked from the, by a reporter that the Chinese were intruding in further and further into territory. Sir, what are you going to do? He gave a one-line answer. I have asked the army to throw the Chinese out. Wonderful. This was an off-the-cuff remark. Nehru didn't probably mean it. He didn't mean to throw the Chinese out. He made the statement for propaganda purposes to tell the Indian people, look, I'm taking action. Chinese interpreted literally. And after that statement on 20th October, they attacked India. The Indian army was totally caught unprepared and defeat was there. There is no point in discussing the war, which was a massive defeat for the Indian Army. It took a long time for the Indian Army to get back into shape. But the generals at that time, as I've already pointed out, they were just squabbling themselves. themselves. Now look at uh, even uh, this gentleman, General Tamaya. He wrote a letter to the Krishna Menon against another Lieutenant General, Verma, in which he made various and wild allegations against him. And... Krishna man in order an inquiry against him. And then later, General Thimaya went to uh, Krishna man and told him that uh, he wished to withdraw that letter because now he had a feeling that uh, he had overstepped everything and the problem was quite different, you know. I mean, you don't expect an army chief to behave in this manner. You resign, you withdraw, you send a letter like this, you withdraw, then you write a letter to the president, you... I mean, you just imagine what sort of a man this gentleman was. And he was the chief of the Indian army. So, Timmy, as they say, Timmy of India. He was an anglicized officer. But all the same, it's a very sad story that such a thing did happen. The men at that time, and then we had another gentleman, Mr. Malik, who was the chief of the intelligence. And he was another man who was feeding all information to Nehru, what Nehru wanted to hear. He told him China is not a threat. China is never going to attack India. How he reached that conclusion, nobody seems to know. But he reached that conclusion. And this is the information he was passing to Nehru. And Nehru was lapping it up and feeling that, yes, he's the right man. He wouldn't listen to Thimaya. At least Thimaya had said to have a border settlement. And had India done that, probably this present precarious situation wouldn't have happened. So, 62 is a stark reminder, my friends, that India failed very badly, both in terms of battle experience, strategic vision, and generalship. The generalship was the poorest ever you can ever think of. None of the generals were working in cohesion together. They were cutting each other's throat. Thapa, later on, Cut a very sorry figure, as you all know, and he had to go away. Now, another point I want to make the man who had later made the army chief, General Chaudhary, was a lieutenant general at that time. Now, keep your ears open. General Chaudhary was friendly with the British High Commissioner in Delhi. 
and for 10 years 10 years he was writing a column for the statesman which was that time a british paper can you imagine a lieutenant general of the indian army writing a paper a column for a foreign newspaper like the statesman he did it for 10 years and later on the same man became the army chief and whatever conversation he used to have with the british high commissioner the british high commissioner was dutifully noting it down and passing it on to london so the british knew precisely what was happening in india so these were the men who let india down it's not just nehru it's easy to blame nehru as responsible but each one of the generals at that time is culpable and frankly if you ask me their names should be erased from the record books for anything that they did and that includes timaya that includes rajendra singh ji i mean i'll leave out karyapa karyapa was a class above all these characters and then there were so many six generals they were superseded we don't know whether they were capable or not capable that was because of the apathy which nehru had always towards the sikhs and that continued for 50 years till the vajpayee government came and then later on one or two sikhs were made the army chief it's all a very very sad story and it looks like a big uh, mela you know a clown a circus the generals there and it's worth reading about that period and we hope that such period doesn't come again but unfortunately even now i find the situation is not very change different there is scrabbling on there's a joint command being thought of a theater command the air force is objecting to it the air chief doesn't want to be part of the uh, joint command because it means the overall command will be with the army so there again i'll talk about that in a different way or a different video but now remembering 62 one must learn the lessons that the generals must be more professional not just pass some stories and keep drinking coffee or tea or have a glass of whiskey in the chemsworth club with the youth crew at that time and carry out all sorts of functions good functions you know which are part of military regalia dining in nights drinking toasts but professionalism was sadly lacking gentlemen i think now i close now i hope you have liked this video and i am talked on an entirely different topic this time we must look inwards and look at how china has become a formidable power and even now while facing the chinese whatever the chinese casualties may have been indians definitely suffered more because indians were not prepared for the simple reason and losing a colonel for nothing is an absolute crime well gentlemen i close now and i hope you like this video please share it with your friends subscribe to my video channel and i close now and i'll say jai hind god bless everybody